35th Guam Legislature is back from recess. When we left, um, we had an amendment that was passed by, uh, by the Senator from Jonia. Senator Therese Talai, you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Bill number 1-35 as amended would provide a tax cut on GRTs from 5% to 3%. For businesses whose gross annual income is more than $50,000 but less than $250,000. The bill does not remove the current Dave Santos exemption for businesses making $50,000 or less, which gives a full gross receipts tax exemption on the first $40,000. I understand the intent of this proposed legislation, and, and I too would like to give for our government to give small businesses an extra. It's increased now from $1,000 to $2,000 annually by the recent amendment. And I also want our local government to pay $5.6 million in local matching funds in this fiscal year to the Medicaid program so that we can access an additional $6.7 million in Federal Affordable Care Act grant funds so that our residents living under the poverty line get the medical care that they need and that private health care providers get paid and will continue to do business with the government of Guam. I also want our government to assist our only public hospital, Guam Memorial Hospital, to be ready for CMS, Centers Medicare, Medicaid and Medicare Services inspections at all times. And I would like to invest in the $50 million of capital improvement projects that GMH needs. 32 million of those are urgent. 21 for the new reporting system, $6 million for the power panel, and $5 million for the new the roof repair. I would also like to provide relief to our working families who have seen an increase in their day-to-day -day expenses as a result of the rise in the GRT, but have not necessarily seen an increase in their wages or the minimum wage. And I can go down the list of other needs of the government in education, public safety, affordable housing, and health insurance. The new fiscal year 2020 budget proposal estimates an additional $19 million more in expenditures compared to this fiscal year. I understand the theory behind providing tax cuts to businesses in hopes that it will spur growth or that they might invest in the Guam economy. I've asked our economists and the government agencies at the public hearings if they can see what the impact of the 2017 Tax Cut and Jobs Act has had on our revenues or growth, and they have been unable to say definitively what the impact has been from those tax cuts. We can see in the first five months of FY19 that we are collecting $20 million less in corporate tax revenue. Where has this $20 million that businesses no longer pay to the government of Guam gone? Why did the legislature, when it increased the GRT, not rely on the trickle-down effect of that corporate savings of $20 million? Instead, as we know, and I opposed the increase in GRT, but we know that the legislature increased the GRT from 4 to 5% in the last term. So it's difficult to understand the impacts on businesses from, from the tax cuts in combination with the GRT increase. But we do know already that this has impacted our working families and consumers. The prices of goods have risen, even though it's unclear how businesses' bottom lines have been impacted by the federal tax cuts but local tax increases. Another tax break to a new class of businesses has no guarantee to decrease the cost of living on these working families. One of the options rejected by the previous legislature prior to accepting an increase in the GRT was to close exemptions from GRT. That did not pass. However, it seems to me that the more we expand exemptions, the less likely we are to 
ever decrease that GRT again for everyone, for consumers especially. I think it's premature to provide another tax cut at this time without some mechanism in place to ensure that working families will indeed benefit from it. So I would like to propose my First Amendment, Madam Speaker, and it's been passed out. Can you go ahead and read it? This, am this amendment uh, would require that any business that would like to claim this tax exemption must pay a minimum wage of $10 per hour. $10 per hour is the equivalent of $21,000 per year for a full-time employee. That is still below the poverty level. If the previous minimum wage bill that was passed by a prior legislature was not vetoed, we would be at $10 per hour. Senator right Lee, you have, I apologize. Do you have a point of information or a point of, of inquiry? I, sorry, I saw you raise up your hand and I heard your voice, so I just want to make sure I read your lips correct. Senator Talahi, I do apologize. You may proceed on the amendment. Well, if I may just reiterate then, Madam Speaker. Um, so this, this First Amendment is just to, to add the language where we give this, these businesses a tax break on their GRT that we say provided that these businesses shall pay their employees a minimum wage of $10 per hour. And as I said, this amendment would, would, um, would still leave the wages below the poverty level for a full-time employee, but it would ensure that businesses who are getting tax breaks from the government right now, or, or a new, this new class of businesses, and this doesn't affect any of those who are getting the original Dave Santis incubator $50,000 uh, program. It doesn't affect those people. But for this new class of, of persons, it would signal that we really do want this money, this tax break that they are getting, to get into the hands of these working families. And so that is the purpose of, of giving the tax breaks to the businesses so that they can in turn take care of their employees. Of course, this is just one way to do it, minimum wage. We could instead you know, require health insurance, but I think this is a good one. But it's, uh, again, $10 an hour still keeps these employees below the poverty level, still you know, uh, in need of government services. Sidious Masi, Madam Speaker, that's my First Amendment. Thank you, uh, Senator Terlahi. On the Senator Therese Terlahi Amendment. Senator Regine Bisco Lee, you are recognized on the amendment. Sidious Masi, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise in objection to this amendment. Um, I object because I know, and you know, all of our colleagues here were pretty seasoned um, in the way that the legislature works. This would certainly, under our rules, trigger a third hearing on this bill if we were to um, proceed down this road. Also, Madam Speaker, I feel like if our colleagues are to object to this bill, then they should object to this bill. I think poison pill amendments like this make it really difficult for us to, a personal continue privilege, our, Madam Speaker. to continue our discussion Senator on Lee, this. Senator one moment, please. S Senator Chalahi, please take your point of personal yes, privilege, I, please. I take a point of personal privilege on the description of my amendment as a poison pill, Madam Speaker. I don't think that's appropriate here in this okay, body. Thank you. I don't think that that was interpreted like that. I will go ahead and uh, acknowledge your point of personal privilege. Senator Lee, please proceed. I believe that a discussion like the minimum wage, increasing the minimum wage, should be afforded the opportunity for the public to weigh in. I feel like it should be a standalone measure that we consider on its own. And it's really important that each of these measures go through the legislative process. And so sticking an amendment like this would be counter to that. And while I support you know, discussions on how we can potentially increase the minimum wage for our people and for working families, I think that 
this measure would absolutely require an additional hearing, and so I object on those grounds. Sujus So, Senator Lee, for the record, I just want to ask you are just objecting to the amendment, not posing to. Yes, I object to the amendment, and oh, and I would also like uh, for a ruling if you believe that it is um, that it would require a secondary hearing. Point of order, Madam Speaker. If you can, Senator Terlahi, oh, okay. uh, give me a second. I am trying to decide how I want to proffer to see if I should facilitate this amendment or not. I am asking for a personal interpretation for myself before I rule. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. Senator, just, just one moment, please. Thank you. Legal counsel, can I have a word with you? Thank point you. of order, Madam Speaker. Say that again. I have. I, I have. Point, I just, point of order. I will go ahead and have you state your point of order first. Yes. In in the discussion on the previous amendment, the point was also raised as to whether it was materially it would make the bill materially different because we had not heard from any of our Sen public agencies as Senator, to the increase may, from a two million to I a may, four Senator, million dollar. Se Senator, if I reduction. may, just based on the information provided to me at this time. I will, address your, I will address your amendment and note that though I think there may be materially different at this time, I am going to go ahead and assess the motion to ask my colleagues to vote because there's an objection on the floor to give credence to the amendment. Anyone else wishing to speak on the amendment? There has been objection. Anybody else on Senator Therese Terlahi's amendment? If not, there has been an objection on the floor. Please, for all those who support Senator Therese Terlahi's amendment, please signify by raising your hand. Motion fails. <laughs> Senator Terlahi, you still have the floor on another amendment. Thank you. Please Thank proceed. you, Madam Speaker. Normally, we are allowed to close on our, on our amendments, but I will proceed to the second amendment. The second amendment, Madam Speaker, has also been put, passed out. And this regards the $250,000 threshold. So as the bill's written, this tax exemption is going to apply to, to entities that are making a gross annual income in excess of 50,000, but not more than 250,000. So my amendment is to change the 250,000 to $100,000. It's this is because it's, it's still unclear, Madam Speaker, how we are determining what a small business or a micro business, as was said earlier, is, is by Guam standards. And we are setting a threshold of $250,000 as opposed to the $100,000, which was suggested a couple of years ago by the, num the members of the Guam Chamber of Commerce and recently by the Women's Chamber. Federally, small business the de definition of small business is determined by each industry based on income, the type of business, and the number of employees. As you know, for our purposes, none of these factors has been included. The federal standard for a small business is seven and a half million dollars for most industries, which obviously would be too high for Guam. And so, we, we haven't done an analysis of what is small or micro for Guam and what that gross income threshold would, what, what threshold would be best. Currently, there are, according to the Department of Revenue and Taxation, 7,700 businesses that are eligible, that are currently taking part uh, in the reduction of GRT through the Dave Santos exemption. 
which is for businesses, again, making less than $50,000, which are in need of incubation in their first years, especially, and in development and growth. There are 1,080 businesses that have a gross income between 50 and 100,000, and another 1,220 businesses making between 100,000 and 250,000. If we lower the threshold to 100,000, that would mean $2,000 for 1,080 businesses, which is a cost of about 2.1 million to the government instead of 4.4 million as currently proposed. And it targets the smaller businesses that we are intending to possess, uh, to assist, the businesses that the Dave Santis was intended. And I know that we've changed it over the years with changing economic times. But if the 2020 budget discussions allow for um, more to be given back to businesses or for a repeal of the increase in the GRT altogether, then we can consider this discussion at that time. And I feel like because the impact of the 4.4 million in light of the, the need for Medicaid program in particular and, and the reduction, the potential complete cutoff or reduction in Medicaid for, for the upcoming fiscal year 2020, that, that all of those really need to be factored in and they, they should be balanced. And so that, that's my proposal to limit it for now, Madam Speaker, and that if in our 2020 budget discussions, which are gonna be coming up in a few months, but during which time we hope to have the real information as to how this impacts what the extra $15 million in expenditures and things like that, then, then perhaps at that time we can consider it better. But so that's my amendment, Madam Speaker. Sidzus Masi, Senator Therese Terlahi. On the Senator Terlahi, Therese Terlahi amendment, anyone wishing to speak on the amendment? Senator Mary Torres, you are recognized. If the uh, retiring speaker could so yield, I just want, um, I missed the, the point. What was the stat that was offered for the number of businesses that are between the threshold of 100,000 to 250,000? I'm trying to, if, if she can please repeat yes, that. Yes, definitely, Senator Torres. Senator Therese, would you like to yield? Yes, Madam Speaker, um, thank you for the question. So between 50 and 100,000, there are 1,080 businesses, and between, and in the threshold from 100 to $250,000, there are 1,220 businesses. Thank you, does that answer your question? Thank you, Senator Torres. Thank you, Senator Torres. Anyone else on the main, the uh, amendment to Senator Therese Light? Senator Regine Biscoli, you are recognized. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I rise in opposition to this amendment, and like the proffer of the, this amendment, I also voted against increasing the GRT, so, or the BPT. So I just can't reconcile to myself how we could move forward leaving 1,220 businesses out in the cold. So I, I oppose. Thank you, uh, Senator Regini. Anybody else wishing to speak on Senator Therese Terlai's main amendment? If not, Senator Therese, would you like to close? Thank you, Madam Speaker. I don't believe that uh, we, are, we are creating a new class of businesses to give a tax exemption to. And I don't think that we didn't include all the other businesses on Guam to get this tax break leaves them out in the cold. And there are many, many more than 1,080. There are many more. We are receiving an additional $60 million, I think, if not more, in GRTs for one year based on the increase from 4 to 5%. So I asked my colleagues again, this would just bring it in line with what, what uh, was originally proposed by the chamber it would keep it to the businesses that are in the greatest need and those that are making a uh, less than 100,000 or less. And it would, it would be more focused on what's intended. It's to help those businesses that are, that are in need of this tax break. But I'm, I'm sure that all businesses, I mean, they did argue that at the, at during the, 
when the legislature was considering raising from 4 to 5 percent, they all argued that it would affect all of them. And uh, so I just think that this would just cater the bill directly to those who the program is intended to, to assist most directly. Sijos Masi, Madam Speaker. Hagumas, uh, Senator Therese Chalahi. There has been an objection to Senator Therese Chalahi's amendment. All those who support the amendment, please signify by raising your hand, please. Five. Motion fails. I do apologize. Senator Therese, you're still recognized on the main motion. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just wanted to close on the bill in general. Um, like I said earlier, you know, I am a beneficiary of the Dave Santis exemption. And so I, I do understand the need for small businesses to, to get boosts from the government. I just think it, we've really not really fully appreciated what the impacts of of the reduction in revenue are going to be when we are in dire need of revenue and if somebody has any other information as to how we're going to get those other needs of the government met then i'm all for it in fact i would say let's let's increase all the tax exemptions across the board but in the previous fiscal year we were supposedly in a fiscal crisis that was less than a year ago we raised taxes, didn't pay agencies their full allotments. The legislature put several cost-cutting measures into the budget, such as a hiring freeze, a freeze on employee increments. We attempted to unfund deputy directors. We restricted travel and wireless communications, suspended certification of pay differential for accountants a suspension on qualifying certificate renewals, a restriction on the use of GovGuam vehicles because of the potential lost revenue from the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. I understand that this legislation would cost the government an estimated $4 million in lost revenues, but I think we should look at the bigger picture of priorities and the needs of our low-income families who are making less than $50,000 a year before providing additional tax cut for the businesses. These, it would be more prudent to consider this new tax exemption as part of the FY20 revenue projections and, and balance the balance this, the impacts of this against the loss of Medicaid and other federal revenue. We will be seeing those very concretely in the next few months and I I just feel like that is really the best time to consider the additional two, two million especially, but arguably the entire four million. That this is going to take effect in 2020, but this is preceding all other 2020 budget discussions, all other 2020 priority expenditures, all other projections of revenue and so um, those are my comments on the bill, Madam Speaker. When to Senator Therese Terlahi, on the main motion, anyone else wishing to speak? Senator Sabina Perez, you are recognized. Sidious Masi, Madam Speaker, I have two amendments to offer to the floor. I believe they're being circulated currently. I do apologize. Everybody has a copy? Uh, Senator Perez, you may okay. proceed, please. So the first amendment would be uh, to delete real property rentals uh, from the uh, um, uh, addition. Um, the reason being is that uh, under the, the current Dave Santos Act, a person who earns 40000 a year uh, is exempt from paying taxes. Um, with, for a person uh, making more than 40000 a year, um, I would characterize that person, uh, that enterprise as being successful. Um, imagine uh, if you're making $40,000 a year, that's roughly $3,333 a month on rental income. And so making something over that would amount to possibly two rental houses or, or uh, rough, roughly to that effect. 
Um, I feel that the uh, exempting those uh, successful businesses of is, um, it would not be prudent um, and it would not be comparable to businesses that are have a higher overhead and low, low profit margins. Um, so uh, th this is the, what the rationale behind uh, deleting that portion from this particular bill. Thank you, uh, Senator Sabina Perez. Are there anyone wishing to speak on the uh, Senator Sabina Perez amendment? Everybody, I hope, has a copy. Senator Therese does not have a copy of the amendment. Can you please provide her? Sergeant of Arms. I respectfully ask if the amendments, if you, if my colleagues have amendments, please make the pertinent copies and have it distributed to all the senators. Anyone wishing to speak? Senator Therese, you're acknowledged on Sabina, Senator Sabina Perez's amendment. Please proceed. I support this amendment, Madam Speaker. It It removes from, from the list of um, types of businesses that this, this, exemption, this exemption that we are granting by this bill is supposed to apply to real property rentals, retailing, service income, and commission income, and farming income. And this removes real property rental. I would support that amendment, Madam Speaker, and, and I guess I, I would just wanted to clarify well I'm going I'm to have to check that with legal later so no I would just support the amendment thank you Senator Tsumasi Senator Therese Senate Legislative Secretary you are acknowledged please proceed so just Masi, Madam Speaker, if the mover of the amendment or uh, the author of the bill can uh, answer a, a point of inquiry, I'd like to know uh, the number of businesses that fall under this category, the real property rentals. Thank you, uh, Senator uh, Shelton, Legislative Secretary. Uh, Senator Sabina, would you like to yield to that question? I will yield to you as the proffer of the amendment. Um, if you so wish to yield to the author, um, please I, let me know. I don't have any information to uh, determine how many businesses that would fall. Effect. Thank you, Senator Paris. Senator Lee, would you like to uh, answer the inquiry? You don't have it. Senator Amanda, um, that, that question is not, read, that answer is not readily available right now. Um, if you would like to speak on the amendment, you're more than welcome. I would like to address you at this time. Thank you, Senator. Anyone else on the amendment? There's an objection. All those wishing to support Senator Sabina Perez's, oh, I do apologize. Please, Senator Perez, you can close on the amendment. So thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I do support the intent of the bill to provide support to our small businesses. Um, I feel that um, though for rental property alone, uh, I, I feel that businesses that are earning $40,000 a year uh, is successful and should not qualify under this exemption. And it would help mitigate, um, considering that we increase the threshold to 100,000, um, we have to figure out where the tax cut, where we're going to um, cut from and I'm hoping that this would help mitigate that increase in our tax cut, our money coming into our revenue uh, stream. Um, so we have to decide where we're gonna cut from in government 
And so this is one measure that we can help mitigate that increase of, of cuts. Cesar uh, Smasi, Senator Paris. Ladies and gentlemen, there, have been, there has been an objection. All those in favor of Senator Sabina Perez's amendment, signify by raising your hand, please. Motion fails. Senator Sabina, you still have the floor. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. The second amendment I have is requiring more accountability with regards to the, this bill. Um, so what this would do, it would require Department of Revenue and Taxation uh, to study the impacts of this bill uh, upon enactment. And it simply would come from uh, basically cumulative, it would basically require DRT to transmit every year on January 1st, a uh, cumulative number of W-2 forms filed and gross receipts paid by all businesses using this exemption. Uh, the number of new business licenses for the year and with, compared with the comparable data uh, for five years prior to the enactment of this bill. I think it's important to uh, show the evidence behind, uh, evidence to support uh, a bill um, to see if it does, ex uh, to, to, in order to evaluate whether we need to expand this bill, uh, if, if it's successful in stimulating our economy. Um, so it's, it's basically it provides accountability uh, with the bill. Thank you, uh, Senator Pears. Um, just looking at the amendment, Senator Pears, if I may, if, Senator Pears, if I may, um, I understand uh, based on your one, two, three, fourth line, you talk about gross point, receipts. Point one moment, order, I'm speaking. just gonna ask her if I may, just for a clarification. If you want to do an amendment to the uh, amendment first to correct from gross receipts to business privileges. I'm going to take a second oh. recess. Okay. Senator Sabina Prayers, on, on the main amendment, please. Yes, thank you for the advice. I, I um, do apologize. Oh, no problem. So, yes, so um, I have uh, been We are back from recess. Oh. Senator Sabina, you so, are acknowledged on the amendment. So, do as Masi, Madam Speaker. So, um, yes, I would like to make an adjustment from where it says line, on line one, two, three, four, line four, uh, where it says gross receipts uh, to business privilege tax taxes so business privilege taxes yes on that amendment are there any objections no objections motion carries on the main amendment by senator sabina paris anyone else wishes to speak are there any objections vice speaker can you come up Speaker Barnes, you are recognized. Cid uh, Masi, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, as I look at the reporting, reporting requirements uh, for the Department of Revenue and Taxation, um, Senator uh, Perez brings up a point of having the, um, the reporting requirements by the Department of Revenue and Taxation shall uh, do a 
annual report to the Magahaga and to the legislature, and such report shall be transmitted by January 1st of the each year and shall include uh, the cumulative number of W-2 forms filed um, based, uh, filed and the business privilege receipts paid by all businesses using this exemption. I think what I want to ask the um, um, author of the amendment, if I may, Madam Speaker, I'll state the question to you, is, is there a reporting requirement based on the number submitted already existing in law today? Senator Perez, do you yield? Yes, I do. Um, if, it do, if, there does, if there is a reporting law, it doesn't address this particular bill. Um, and so this would isolate those businesses that are exempt from taxes and would basically focus, um, basically gathering data that would show the impacts of the bill. Madam Speaker, does that response yes. suffice? Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, if I may, um, I do know that uh, based on, on previous terms and working closely with the Department of Revenue and Taxations, that um, categorically um, uh, reports are already submitted based on the number of businesses, the number of W-2s reported and, and categorized, and usually based on the application that that this August body has submitted on the in the past before, that 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 software application is probably already in place, and without at least checking if that could already automatically be done, I do not want to give the department. A revenue and tax um, um, agency or authority, the op, the un, inundated responsibility of doing an additional task when something can already be pulled out. So, just because, again, I'm just speaking from past experience and knowing. I'm I'm not assuming. I'm speaking from past experience that there have. There is already a formula that is categorized to separate this based on the application. I'm just going to respectfully oppose and <laughs> object to this time. So thank you for very much for giving me the opportunity. I appreciate the good author for bringing this uh, amendment through. We understand that reporting requirements are very, very very important. It gives us compiled data, gives us the opportunity to, um, to literally see how much more resources we could get for our island. But in this particular case, I'm almost positive, I could be wrong, but I'm almost positive that it, is our, it could already be afforded accordingly. So just for now, I will object to this amendment, unless somebody could offer uh, that, that it is not done. Susan Massey, Madam Thank Speaker. Um, there has been an objection. Senator Torres, you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I think with every new bill that we have that is going to create um, a relief and maybe some a decrease in, in revenues, there's always a, a, a concern about, you know, what is the, the good effect of that? What would, what would be the the net uh, gain from having such a measure. And I can, I can see and appreciate the, th the forward thinking of the, the uh, mover of this amendment. However, I want to point out that in looking at the amendment for what it, it states, I don't think that it's really a fair uh, sort of amendment to have such reporting requirements to gauge whether Bill 135 is effective or not. And I, I say that it's, it's, it's not fair because I believe that it's measuring something that is not entirely contemplated by Bill, Bill 135. Bill 135 is not a measure that is intended to increase employment, nor is it a measure uh, to determine whether uh, it, it's not intended to either increase employment or employee numbers or increase the number of businesses. And I, from, from my understanding of Bill 135 when I attended the public hearing, 
It was a measure, measure to help small businesses to thrive and remain in business by providing incentives and some relief that would strengthen the businesses, allow them to reinvest in their businesses, allow them to um, essentially not strain under the, the, the weight of um, staying open. I mean, we, we know that there are a lot of challenges to biz keeping a business thriving and, and doors open these days because of expenses. So I, I, I also support the objection to this amendment because I think that, that what it does is it measures something that is really not the intent of Bill 135. Bill 135 is really meant to just help small businesses keep their doors open, not necessary to have more businesses come in or more employees you know, grow from those existing businesses. So with that, I think, I think we just need to stay pure to the intent of 135 and keep it as simple as it is contemplated and not you know, compromise or complicate additional expectations other than the basic premise that it is intended to give relief and help businesses stay open. Sisu Smasi. See, just Masi, um, Senator uh, Torres, uh, Senator Regine Biscoli on the Senator Perez Amendment. Sisu Masi, Madam Speaker, and I thank the proffer of this amendment. Um, and I, I rise to a point of inquiry if the, the proffer of this amendment would yield. Uh, go ahead and state your question, please, Senator. I just had some questions. I know that the previous um, St. Augustine Amendment passed, which would change the effective date. And so I, we know that BPT is paid monthly by these businesses. So I just want to make sure that if this reporting requirement amendment passes, that we are able to capture those um, at the appropriate time. So I believe that we might want to reconsider um, the date to possibly February first of 2020 just to make sure that it's accomplishing the stated goal <laughs> um, you can move to amend the uh, Senator um, Paris, there, there has been an inquiry in reference to the date change. And um, before I yield back to Senator Paris, would you like to answer the question for consideration? Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. I do appreciate um, uh, the former speaker's question and point of inquiry. Um, yeah, so I would think a year's time would be a good snapshot uh, in looking at the impacts of a bill. Um, I think um, versus month, monthly um, impact statement, I think uh, it'd be good to see a, a wider view of this. So I would like to retain the, the date. Thank um, If I also may speak some more uh, regarding whether the um, reports are done currently, I did talk to uh, Director Shimizu um, during the recess, and they are not currently doing this type of uh, data uh, analysis. Um, so it is something within their power and it's something that they can include in the processing of business uh, license and uh, business uh, tax um, submissions. And so we do have uh, some verbal agreement that this could, this could be implemented. Sijus Masi, Senator Paris. Senator Lee, does that address your question? Thank you very much. Is there anyone else wishing to speak on Senator Perez's amendment? God bless you. There has been an objection. Uh, Senator Vice Speaker Nelson, you are recognized on Senator Perez's amendment. Sijus Masi, Madam Speaker, I rise in support of this amendment. Uh, Madam Speaker, we are, I would like to vote for a bill that provides uh, transparency. And we are always saying we need transparency in the government. We just heard that um, from the previous speaker that they are not tracking this type of data. And some of the biggest challenges in the choices that we make is that there's not enough data to support or um, refute 
the legislation that we push. And data is very important, especially when we're making choices that impact our island and our people, and especially the communities. And so really, Madam Speaker, it's just a requirement to ensure that, hey, what we're doing, it's helping the small businesses, it's working, and rather it taking, because this is removing $4 million from the general fund, rather that it is removing the $4 million, we are seeing a perpetuation of the investment because of this exemption. And so I'd like to thank the sponsor for this amendment and I rise in support of it. Cesar Smasi, uh, Vice Speaker. Anyone else wishing to speak on the amendment? If not, Senator Paris, you're more than welcome to close. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I think it's very important when we make policy that we have evidence uh, to back up our policies. And if the evidence does show that this act is very successful, then we can make that decision to further it even more. So I think, if anything, this amendment strengthens uh, the act. So it was Masi. Hago Mas, Senator Paris, Point Pubetsu. Uh, there has been an objection uh, to the Senator Sabina Paris amendment. All those in support of Senator Paris's amendment, please signify by raising your hand. Three, four, five, six. Motion fails. Thank you. Um, Senator Will Castro on. I apologize. Sorry. Senator Sabina, still on the main motion. You have a couple of minutes left. Senator, did you still want to speak or are you okay? On the main motion. Th thank you, Senator Perez. Um, on the main motion, if anyone else wishing to speak, if not, Senator Lee, would you like to close? On one. Madam Speaker, and I want to extend a thank you to all my colleagues for their amendments and suggestions and input on this bill. I want to thank my fellow co-sponsors and my colleagues who spoke in support of this measure, but i also like to thank the Leon Guerrero Tenorio Administration and our experts at BBMR, DRT, and GIDA for their continued collaboration and cooperation. I'd also like to thank the following organizations and small businesses who have come out to support Bill 1. The National In Association of Insurance and Financial Advisors of the Marianas, the Guam Women's Chamber of Commerce, the Guam Association of Realtors, Guam Unique Merchandise and Arts, and a number of other small businesses that have submitted um, testimony. Bill 1, as amended, as we have discussed today, puts, before, puts forth before us the fundamental question of who can best put work to work the money earned by our local small businesses. The passage of Bill 1 says that small business owners should be able to decide for themselves. It provides an effective tax cut of nearly half a business's existing BPT liability. With this money, small business owners can spend on improvements. They can increase wages and jobs or provide added benefits potentially to their employees. Whether Republican or Democrat, we all want firefighters when we need them, police officers when we are in trouble, good teachers in our schools and decent roads. But the money that pays for these things doesn't just fall from the sky. Day in and day out, our small businesses pay for the privilege of existing in this community. It's our small businesses that receive the brunt of the downturns of our economy, especially in these austere times, when our experts warn us of impending negative economic growth. Bill 1 allows small and micro businesses to keep more of the dollars and cents they own because business is hard and being a small and micro business is even harder. 
This bill paves the way for our small businesses to avoid being just another statistic from the Small Business Administration. While fiscal and budgetary analysis may tell us what this bill will cost the government, we must not discount the economic benefit of Bill 1 and what we will gain when hundreds of businesses breathe a little easier or grow in economic confidence. And I just want to share with my colleagues one example of that. We've seen many food trucks pop up in our community over the last few years, and I think it's incredible. Anything that you could possibly want to eat, there's lots of fusion, there's breakfast food trucks, um, smoothies, there's a ton of things that you could potentially do. And what these small food truck businesses, in addition to all the rest of our small businesses, really thrive on is consistency. When they're able to consistently put out their products on time, they're able to grow their business, they're able to potentially hire more employees. And for some of them, some of our local food trucks have been so successful that they've been able to parlay that into a brick and mortar business, like Mosa's. And so when we give these small businesses, these small food truck entrepreneurs or other small businesses in our community that opportunity to grow, that's a huge win for our community. That's a huge win. It creates jobs, it strengthens our, in our economy, and it helps to even promote tourism. Lots of tourists go to restaurants in our community like Mosa's or like Pika's Cafe. Lots of very small and micro businesses that over the years have been able to grow. And so that's really the impetus behind this bill, Madam Speaker. In these austere times, Madam Speaker, we are called to do everything we can to empower our local small businesses, to help them succeed, and in turn, to help us turn the tide to ensure economic growth. We need to expand the circle of economic opportunity, not shrink it. So with that, I thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I thank my colleagues, and I look forward to the support of my colleagues on the passage of Bill 1 in support of our small and micro businesses here on Guam. Sidhu Asmaasi. Buen Pobetsu, uh, Senator Lee, uh, on the motion, uh, Senator Lee, on the motion to push it to the voting file. I'd like to move to send the bill down to the voting file. On that. Senator, uh, uh, Vice Speaker Nelson, I apologize. Sita uh, Smasi, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, um, notwithstanding the House rules, I'd like to uh, request that we can reconsider the actions of the body on voting on the previous amendment. Um, that is not a debatable one. There is a motion to move for reconsideration on on, on which amendment? Um, this is just for the Section 2 reporting requirements where uh, DRT tracks the impact of the bill. Clerk. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the bill has not been put into the voting file. There was a notwithstanding motion to read it, consider the actions of, if I can, can I see the amendment, please? There was a motion to reconsider Senator uh, Sabina Perez's amendment to um, uh, on line eight, page two, regarding the reporting requirements. Are there any objections? For the reconsideration, there is an objection. All those who wish to um, uh, support the reconsideration on the reporting requirements as introduced by Senator Perez, signify by raising your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Motion passes. 
Uh, Vice Speaker, you're recognized. Um, so you want to? See, just Masi, Madam Speaker, I'd like to call on a vote for the reporting requirements amendment. On that, there has been a reconsideration for that. I'd ask, are there any objections for the vote? The senator, the senator Sabina Paris amendment as amended with the yes there was a motion for the reconsideration there was an objection so i'm calling for the vote the, it passed the motion passed for the reconsideration to bring it back so you're going to have to vote for the amendment on the reconsideration. So that's where we are at, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, unless, unless my colleagues have something. Thank you. So we are now voting on the reconsideration to vote and accept the motion as proffered by Senator Paris. If we get the affirmative, then the motion will be, I mean, then the amendment will be included in the bill. With that being said, for the Sabina Paris Amendment, is there any objections? Here, there is an objection. All those in support of Sabina Paris's amendment, please signify by raising your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Motion carries. Siju Asmasi. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now on bill number 3-35LS. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, on the motion to bring bill number 1-35LS as uh, Senator Lee, just for clarification of the record, if you can remove, uh, move the motion on uh, bill-1-35. Thank, Thank you, Ma Madam Speaker. Um, on, I'd like to move that we move bill 1-35 um, into the voting file. On that motion, without an objection, motion carries. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now on bill dash three dash, bill number three dash 35 LS. Senator Louise Munya, you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I move to that the amended bill number three dash 35 as amended by the Committee on Health, Tourism, Historic Preservation, Land and Justice be accepted by the body. And that would be Bill number 3-35 LS. Bill 3-35 LS. Thank you, ma'am. Madam Speaker. <laughs> on, on the motion to the third reading, please proceed, Senator Munya. Madam Speaker, I move that amended Bill number 3-35 LS be placed in the third reading file, and I'd like to speak on it. With... Are there any objections? No objections. Please proceed. Okay. Madam Speaker, this July, Guam will mark 75 years since our island was liberated from enemy occupation. Most of the war survivors living today were children. They were children not unlike children of today. They played with other kids, they went to church with their families, and they attended school. The events that began on December 8, 1941 changed their lives forever. During the next two and a half years, our people endured horrors and atrocities that no child should ever have to see. They witnessed executions, rapes, torture, and the worst of humanity or inhumanity. In a few short years following the war, the government of the United States officially forgave the empire of Japan for all acts of war it waged against the U U.S. during World War II. These included the attack on Pearl Harbor and the occupation of Guam. In doing so, they denied Guam's people the right to seek justice for crimes committed by their occupiers. Although the U.S. government refused to commit its vast financial resources to compensate war survivors for their atrocities committed by enemy soldiers in World War II, they did acknowledge their responsibility for forgiving Japan's war crimes on Guam and use Guam's Section 30 tax dollars to fund war claims awards. 
It is the intent of this bill to add war claims to the list of exemptions that Guam law provides for creditors' claims. 75 years, that's a long time to wait for recognition of the loyalty our people showed during the occupation. At no point in time did any lender, collection agency, or creditor testify that they supported the World War II Loyalty Recognition Act so survivors can pay their bills. Madam Speaker, I ask you and my colleagues to support this bill that will allow war survivors to keep their awards. The survivors suffered and sacrificed during the Great War, and 75 years is just too long a wait for recognition of their loyalty. Also, Madam Speaker, um, I've just discussed with legal as well, too, um, that, they, that they will make a minor adjustment uh, to renumber the subsection to number 17. And if we could take a look at the bill, there's a, an act to add a new subsection 23111A, in parentheses it says 16 there. Um, we're gonna change that to 17 to reflect what's currently uh, in the law now. Senator Munya, are you offering an amendment? Um, we could offer an amendment, but um, legal says they can, um, they can also just change it um, once we, uh, once we vote on it. Okay. Thank you. So if the body would, would like, we can just have legal do it. Just change the number. Noted. Thank right. you, Senator Munya. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Is there anyone that would like to speak on the bill? Uh, Speaker Barnes, you're recognized. Madam Speaker, for giving me the opportunity to rise in support of Bill Number 3-35 Ellis. I promise I'll make it brief, but I talked to the good author, and, um, and she, I want to make a motion to see if I can support her efforts and be uh, a co-sponsor to this. So on the first, on a motion, uh, Speaker. There has been a motion uh, to be added as a co-sponsor. Any objections? No objection. Motion passes. Sizu Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker and my colleagues, um, as each day goes by, the greatest generation that ever lived continues first to wait and wait and wait. And when this bill was being proffered and I saw it, I wanted to take the time to thank the good senator from GIGO for literally, again, taking this time to acknowledge our greatest generation that ever lived, our sinus. The ones who had to endure the sufferings and the atrocities of World War II. The ones who had to continue to wait. The ones that continued to patiently seek and have an alternative for Guam to pay them for the war claims. Madam Speaker, this is a very good bill. As a matter of fact, it's a, it's a really, really excellent bill. I just hope, Madam Speaker, and I pray that maybe there will be good news tomorrow. And maybe with the 500 plus applications that have already been approved, that maybe our sinus who truly qualified to get a little of what was really due to them, I just hope that that realization will come. I even pray that it will come tomorrow. I stand and rise in full support of this bill. I want to thank the good author for not forgetting. As we do celebrate 75 years of liberation come July, We say forgiveness wipes away the tears of war, but we shall never forget. This is at least one small way of showing that 
we didn't forget. So I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. I want to thank the author for preparing this legislation, and I really hope that my colleagues will give this bill a unanimous support. Sidzu Osmasi. Sidzu Osmasi, Madam Speaker, are there any other members that would like to speak on the motion? Senator Shelton, then Senator San Augustine, and then Senator Kelly Marsh Taitsno. Senator Shelton, you are recognized. Sidzu Osmasi, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise in support of Bill Number 3-35. I too believe our Manamku have faced a long, hard road to getting war claims for the last 75 years. From the Guam Meritorious Claims Act to the Hopkins Report to the War Reparations Commission formed by Senator Cecilia Cruz Bamba that collected testimonies from hundreds of people who lived and suffered and survived the brutal occupation during World War II. In her capacity as senator, she also testified before the U.S. Congress about the atrocities of war, becoming the first Chamorro woman to testify before Congress. Her son, Senator George Bamba, continued her work with the Bamba Report in the 1980s. Congressman Antonio Wanpat, Ben Blas, Robert Underwood, and Congresswoman Madeline Berdalio introduced a total of 14 bills through the years to settle war claims for our people. Congressman Robert Underwood established the War Claims Review Commission in 2002, and from those commission findings, Congresswoman Berdalio introduced the Guam World War II Recognition Act, which incorporated those findings into legislation. Congressman Sig Nicholas now has two bills in Congress, which will bring closure on this issue, and finally, recognize the suffering of our people, which this body unanimously supported last session. This compensation is more than just money. It is recognition for the suffering that our people endured. As Beatrice Emsley said in her testimony before Congress, recognize us, please. It was a plea for human dignity, a cry from the depth of the Chamorro soul yearning for the acknowledgement that our suffering is not forgotten, not swept under the rug of history, but recognized finally for the trauma it has caused and the spirit it has, that has endured. It would be a grave insult to injury to allow creditors to garnish war claims or allow anyone but our survivors and their families to take this away from them after 75 long years. I stand in support of this bill. I stand in support of our Manamku, our greatest generation. And I too have also asked the author of this bill if I may be added as one of her co-sponsors. Sidhu Asmasi, Madam Speaker. Thank you, uh, Senator Shelton, on that motion. Without any objection, Motion carries. Senator Joseph Augustine, you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You know, Madam Speaker, I do, I do rise in support of the intent of the bill. The only thing I'm concerned about is that if we pass a bill that says, creditors, you can't go after somebody that owes you money, that's the court that will decide that. Then the, big, the biggest question would be, can we legally deny creditors? I can understand if you file bankruptcy. That's a different. There's laws that governs that. But I do understand the intent of the bill. I do have surviving parents that will be receiving compensation. So I do understand I have plenty or a lot of relatives that will be receiving. Sure, I don't want creditors to go after that money. But if you owe, you owe. And I do understand, and you know, like I said, I do support the intent of the bill, but I just question if it will stand up in court. Thank you, ma'am. Sidzu Osmasi, Senator St. Augustine, anybody else on the main motion? Senator Therese Talahi, you are recognized. Senator Talahi, you are recognized. Okay.
Okay. Senator March will be after Senator Chalahi. You you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> I rise in support of the bill. I was actually. Um, it took me a while to. It's a very short bill. It's a one sentence bill. It adds one clause to an existing law, where the legislature has listed exemptions from uh, creditors. And at first, I I thought, well, okay, but. I kind of just glossed over it thinking, not that necessary. But the more I thought about it and the more I thought about it, that's really when the reality of it really struck me is that the reality that our Manamco are facing after 75 years, after surviving a war, after all they have been through, are actually facing creditors who may take this cash of theirs in, in their elderly years is really, um, really the maybe the more shocking reality that Guam is facing is that we are facing Manamco who are really living in sometimes dire condition. A lot of we have very high poverty levels on Guam, and I am afraid, and I haven't looked at the census recently, but I am afraid that. A lot of that consists of the uh, elderly. And, and I guess that's really what the shocking part of this bill really is. And so, of course, I stand in full support of the bill. I thank the author for the bill. And I, I was very honored to um, work on this bill through my committee. But the, um, what I would, I guess I wanted to just point out to the previous speaker that uh, the statute that lists this, these exemptions from from attachment or execution or um, other claims. Uh, it also says in subsection B that no article, however, or species or property mentioned in this section is exempt from attachment or execution issued upon a judgment recovered for its price or upon a judgment for foreclosure or of a mortgage or other lien thereon. So again, the reality is that it's possible that even their war claims might, might be um, pursued uh, from creditors of a mortgage or, or a judgment in a, law, in a lawsuit. So um, I don't know. That's just uh, kind of sobering, I guess. It's, uh, it's, I think um, we are all going to contemplate this and many other things, uh, this is, you know, beginning now and through, through July and August. And we have an opportunity to partake in memorial services uh, at the different sites that, you know, our government has recognized to, to honor these survivors. We have a Survivor's Day coming up. We have a, we're going to have, you know, an opportunity to go to the memorials at uh, Fena, Faha, Tinta, um, and other ones, two new ones in the island. So I'm, I'm very happy about that. And I'm looking forward to it. My experience in celebrating with the Manamco liberation is really, it's a celebration of their life and what they've been through. And, and I guess this is it also, right? These types of bills, we're also celebrating them, what they've been through. These are, these are token things, really. And unbelievably, it's unbelievable that they are necessary at all, right? And so, but, but glad to do this, this token, this little thing that we can do and uh, hope that it, it helps some of them. And uh, hope that we just continue to find ways to help all of them. Sizus Masi, Madam Speaker. Hagoma, Senator Therese Chalai. We have Senator Marsh and then Senator Lee. Senator Titano Marsh, I mean, Marsh Titano, you are recognized on the main motion. Sujus Malasi, Madam Speaker. Many good points have been brought up, and I understand, in fact, I've had to think through some of these issues myself. Um, as one of the former speakers mentioned, uh, dead is dead and what's owed is owed. But 
as another speaker had mentioned, um, the more I thought about this and the more I really contemplated the gravity of what was being discussed. I have taught about this subject for over 12 years. Every semester, twice a year at the very least, we, we talk about this in some depth. And then, of course, as one of the other speakers mentioned, there are these many events as we, we commemorate, we pay respect to, we remember, and that's so important for us to continue to do. And so the conclusion that I've gotten to is that there are some things that are so traumatic, they are so sacred, that really they should be held apart. The respect and recognition to Guahan's war survivors, much of which, as was mentioned earlier, was exceedingly harsh. Lives were lost. There were mass executions, beheadings, people buried alive, uh, people beaten until their bones were broken or beaten to death. That respect and recognition as we all know, it has not been just, it has not been equitable, and certainly 75 years later, it has not been timely. And in my assessment, it has not been proper, even with where we are at today. I'm grateful that we're at a point that we may be providing something but we know that we are paying for their sacrifice ourselves. That eventually it was we who stepped up to the plate. And it was our community that was asked to pay. So I stand in support of this, this bill. I want for those, uh, if, if they are indeed ever actualized, those war claims, to give them as much protection as we can, to cause people to think before they, they ask if they do end up having a legal right to touch those claims. And I certainly hope that the war survivors finally get the recognition by receiving the war claims that it actually occurs. So just Masi. Haguma Senator Taitsuno Ben Pubetsu. Senator Regine Biscoli, you're recognized. Sijos Masi, Madam Speaker, I rise in support of this measure and I, I want to thank the author and the co-sponsors of this measure. Um, I think we all, many things have been said and I agree with many of my colleagues and the retiring speaker. If there are any of my colleagues out there that are concerned about the cost of this measure, I think we really shouldn't be thinking about the cost because when you've already paid the price, cost shouldn't matter. And our government certainly shouldn't be profiting from the suffering of others. And so I really want to just commend again the author of this bill. I think it's very timely and I'm looking forward to many of the celebrations that we'll have in the coming months as we look forward to the 75th anniversary. And I thank my colleagues in advance for their support of this measure. Sijo uh, Smasi, Senator Lee. Uh, Vice Speaker uh, Nelson, you are recognized. Sijo Smasi, Madam Speaker, I have a point of inquiry for the sponsor of the bill. Please state your question. Uh, in the previous statement, it, there was a cost mentioned. I was just wondering, what is, what is this cost? The, the cost? To the... Uh, 
to the author of the legislation? That's correct. What is Senator the, is there Ruiz, a cost? would you like to uh, Perhaps I missed acknowledge? Something. Madam Speaker, I'm not quite sure. Um, is she re uh, is uh, the good Senator referring to the cost of the previous speaker that she was discussing? Because I'm that's not correct. sure there what was cost. A, that's yeah. correct, Madam Speaker. I, there was a yeah. concern about I, cost. I'm unaware so I'm just, of, a, of, of a cost. I, I don't understand that. That's I, I maybe, maybe she was talking about um, the, the, the cost of the endurance and the, the, the atrocities that they, that's probably the cost that she's talking and not monetary value. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Senator Munya. Vice Speaker Nelson. The, yeah, thank, thank you for clearing that up, Madam Speaker. I was kind of lost in the rhetoric of it all. Thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome, Cesar Smasi. Um, anyone else wishing to speak on the main motion? If not, I will ask uh, the senator from Chico to please close. Thank you, Madam Speaker. First of all, I just want to thank all of the, my colleagues for our colleagues for their, their concerns and, and definitely their support. I want to thank you, Madam Speaker, for um, asking to be a co-sponsor as well as uh, Senator Amanda Shelton for asking to be a co-sponsor. July 21st is just right around the corner, and I had to stand up here with a script because if I had talked about one of the reasons why it's so meaningful to me, I might have gotten emotional too. Um, one of our matriarchs too, she was 15 when this war happened, um, Mrs. Maria Borja Cruz. And I can't even imagine what she went through back in 19, uh, you know, back in 1944 when it happened. It just... It was so traumatic for her that she can't even speak to us about it. So there is nothing on this floor that we can do that can protect anything from what the court may have to say. Um, but we at least have to make an effort to try. And I think this is what we're doing here is we're making that effort to show them that what it was that happened to them that long ago, we can at least try, try to, to protect them and what is definitely owed to them after 75 years. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Senator, I move to, yeah, Madam Speaker, I move to uh, place uh, bill number 3-35 LS into the voting file. On that motion, without any objections, motion carries. Senator Will Castro, you are recognized just to set aside, please. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I'd like to move to set aside bill number 7-35 on behalf of Senator Tuttle, tied to we in consideration of... Uh... Just to set it aside. Yes, ma'am. On that motion, without any objection, motion carries. I do apologize. Senator Kelly Marsh on bill number 12-35 LS. Sujus Masi, Madam Speaker. Notwithstanding the House rules, I move to accept bill number 12-35 LS as substituted by the Committee on General Government Operations, Appropriations, and Housing, and further substituted on the floor. Uh, if, I, if I may, uh, uh, good Senator from Nimitz, if, do you have a copy of the substituted version? And has it been passed out to everybody? Yes, it should be here. Uh, it's in the blue folders. I, I just want to make sure there is a substituted version. I just want to make sure that the further substitution is in the blue folder. If not, Senator Taitsuno, has it been disseminated? Can we have a, a brief recess to make sure that we have the correct yeah. If version. I can have the Sergeant of Arms uh, take that, I'm going to take a moment recess and come right back.
The legislature is back from recess. Senator Kelly Marsh Titanu, you are recognized on uh, Bill Number 12-35 LS. Sidusmasi, Madam Speaker. So just to clarify, I move to place Bill Number 12-35 LS as substituted by the Committee on General Government Operations, Appropriations, and Housing, and further substituted on the floor on the second reading file and would like the opportunity to discuss. Motion to accept first. The Senator, can you just say motion to accept? Motion Who's to accept. Motion to accept. On that motion to accept, without any objections, motion carries. Senator Marsh on the third, on the motion for third reading. So, Bill, Madam uh, Senator, sorry. if I may, motion to go into the third reading, and then you can either discuss briefly oh. or put it into the voting file. That is your <laughs> prerogative, please. Uh, motion to go to the third reading. And would you like to discuss or put it into the voting file? Uh, and I would like the opportunity to discuss. Please proceed. <laughs> so Bill 12-35 LS, it is a bill, uh, fortunately, we have all co-sponsored this as an act of recognizing that we're ushering in this new era, so to speak, of uh, expanding some of our governmental roles I have taught about historian Guahan or history of Guam for over 12 years, and we have long talked about what we would do in the eventuality of having a female governor. If we look at uh, the legal documents, if we look at the typical statements, in the past, we've been locked into referring to the governor as Magatlahi, and only Magatlahi. This bill recognizes both Magatlahi, but also formally brings in to our legal language Magahaga as an official reference for the governor of Guam. It also recognizes Segundo Magahaga as the lieutenant governor to a female governor as an official reference to the lieutenant governor. We have both, of course, English and Chamorro languages as our official languages of Guam. And as I mentioned, I Magatlahan Guahan has been the accepted Chamorro reference for governor, and it has been a very common practice. Likewise, I Segundo Magatlahan Guahan has been that male reference that has kind of been accepted as being universal. So what this bill will do is it recognizes both the English and Chamorro language. It gives primary um, emphasis to Chamorro, which is the indigenous language to Chamorros, and is so important for us all to be taking an active part in using and maintaining, helping the language continue on for the next many generations. This aligns the Chamorro gender element for governor with the Organic Act. It adopts the orthography that has been advised by I Commission, I Fino Tsumaro, Zan I Finanagwin, his I Historia, Zan I Lenatla, I Tau Tau Tanu or the Commission on Chamorro Language and the Teaching of the History and Culture of the Indigenous People of Guam. This bill expands the language to include that these forms of address be included in public documents, contracts, agreements, or official recordings of public acts or transactions that refer to E. Magatlahan Guahan and E. Segundo Magatlahan Guahan and allies the Chamorro gender reference where there could be a material difference. So with that, Sujuis um, Maasi for letting me provide those opening remarks. Sujuis Maasi, uh, Senator uh, Marsh Taitino, um, uh, Legislative Secretary uh, Shelton, you are recognized. Sujuis Maasi, Madam Speaker. 
I rise in support of Bill number 12-35 as one of the co-sponsors. And for many people, this bill might seem like a trivial matter, but I supported this bill as the chairwoman of the Committee of the Advancement of Women because our laws should acknowledge our reality. And what was once just a dream is just that now, our reality. We have our first female governor for the first time in our history. And it would be an insult to her accomplishment and the accomplishment of all women who break glass ceilings to continue to use the improper words to describe them and their positions. Let our children live in a future in which Magahaga is just as common as a Magalahi. Let our young girls not limit themselves because they have not imagined a world with women in charge. Not only is the future Famalawan, as we see in this hall, the present is Famalawan. Sidhu Asmasi, Madam Speaker. Hagumas, Gwen uh, Povetsu, Legislative Secretary. Anyone else on the main motion? Senator Mary Torres, you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I rise in support of this bill, Bill 12-35. And the, what I especially appreciate about this bill is that it mandates that, that uh, references to the Magatlahi, Segundo Magalahi, I Magahaga, and Segundo Magahaga are included also in all public documents and contracts, agreements, or official recordings of public acts or transactions of Guam. And I think that that aids in our efforts and the Commission's efforts to include where appropriate and everywhere appropriate the references to the, the Chamorro titles of our leaders. So the fact that it includes the public documents and, and all others, I think, is what I find most um, important about this bill. And I just want to commend the authors, the primary sponsors, and uh, of course, we've all joined in for that, that foresight. Sidhu's Maasi. Buen Pobetsu, Senator Torres. Anyone else wishing to speak on the main motion? Senator Teresa Talai, you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I also wanted to rise in support of the bill. And uh, I, I very much appreciate the efforts of the sponsor, although I know that sometimes uh, the spelling of Chamorro is controversial or you know, even which word we're going to use. I think we even had a debate on how to say second but during the public hearing. However, I do want to celebrate this moment because of the fact that it really um, emphasizes that, that we have a commission, a commission that is, that is taking the lead, that is intent, it has already established an orthography, it has added to the orthography that was adopted years ago, it has made it a formal part of government and learning. It's all over DOE. They've trained DOE. They are working with everyone in our community, agencies, and, and I, I'm very proud of them for the work that they have done to, to pull this all together and to, I think, what they do by, by being the authority is, um, you know, nobody likes a boss, but having an authority in these types of issues helps us all to have confidence in our speaking tomorrow uh, with each other and and so that and that's really the whole goal is to have something uniform so that learning it is easier people learn it with confidence they can use it with confidence in government service and so uh, i really like that aspect that when uh, this bill had its public hearing the commission came in and really uh, you know laid it down for us as to what the orthography rules are and, and why we should use different rule, uh, words at different times. And so I, I, I love the debate that our community continues to have over which words to use and which would be the proper terms, but I accept their authority in these matters at this time because I think we're going to move forward together and we can continue to debate. Uh, that's part of the fun of our, our culture in, um, 
you know, the different ways to say things, but uh, I think going forward with confidence on how we are going to use these particular terms is a great service to all of us and, and our children in learning the language. Sidus Masi to the sponsor. Hagumas, Senator and Terlahi. Anyone else on the main motion? If not, Senator Marsh, would you like to close and put it on the voting file? Motion to put it in the voting file? Consiglia, put for vote. Sujus Masi, Madam Speaker. Yeah. Um, I, I want to. Uh, Senator Dispensa, put for vote. Um, we do have just a technical, uh, if I can just get a technical moment for a recess, okay. and we'll come right back. Thank you.
the legislature is back from recess. Senator Marsh uh, Tachino, thank you for giving us the opportunity to work on the logistics. You are recognized on the closing. Sijuus Maasi, Madam Speaker. Um, it, was, it was a very good, productive work during the recess. It's so important as we move forward that the orthography is in place and that we are moving forward uh, as, in as unified a manner as possible. I want to thank the different speakers that stood up and supported the bill. They made excellent points. The president is in many ways Famalawan. We do need to make sure that everybody in our community, male and female, are finding ways to be inspired, look ahead, find something that they aspire to. And so we do hope that creating this equity and getting these terms formally a part of our everyday language will do some of that. We have the Commission if you know tomorrow that is leading the way in many of these efforts. We have active dialogue going on by our community. We are seeing place names and street signs um, all being updated to traditional names, using the new orthography, and so forth. And these are all positive movements forward, for which I am very grateful. So with all of that, and again, my support uh, and appreciation to everyone here who was a co-sponsor, I think it was a wonderful move of unity to start off this new year together. Uh, I would like to move the Bill 12-35 LS to the voting file. On that motion, without any objections, motion carries. Vice Speaker, uh, Majority Leader Nelson, you are recognized. So just Masi, Madam Speaker, I'd like to make a motion that we recess till 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. Without any objection, motion carries. Sijus Masi, have a safe evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. We are in recess. <laughs>